Jeffrey Bryce with Iron Company. Uh, in addition to being a national champion in two strength sports and an IPF world champion powerlifter, Marty is also a national and world champion team coach. So this week we got a Facebook request from David Whitley. He wants to talk about overhead pressing. Yeah, I know, Dave. And I know, and I know Marty is uh, quite fond of the overhead press, so I thought it was a good topic to get into. Um, so first of all, Marty, let's talk about uh, the relationship, if any, between flat benching and overhead pressing. Okay. Well, uh, I think first off, the first thing to talk about is the fact that how the uh, the overhead press has fallen into disuse, particularly over the past oh, 20 years. Uh, used to be that it was the premier uh, progressive resistance exercise, and that was the the benchmark that men had uh, that's been supplanted by the bench press in this day and age. The, uh, the old rule of thumb would be is that a man needed to, to over, clean an overhead press body weight. Uh, the press is fabulous exercise. It should not fall into disuse. Uh, those people that do do presses in this day and age usually tend to use machines. And as you know, JP, machines are um, decidedly inferior to free weights. You can ask me that rhetorical question now. Why? <laughs> Uh, yeah, machines eliminate the third dimension of tension, the need to control side-to-side -side movement. Uh, free weights uh, cause muscle stabilizers to go crazy, which is what we want if we're talking in terms of stimulation and growth. With a, with a press machine, or any machine really, you're reduced to pushing or pulling. There's no need to control the side-to-side -side, uh, motor pathway of the movement because the motor pathway is frozen. So, by switching from a machine to a barbell, you increase the instability. By switching from a barbell to a dumbbell, you further increase the degree of instability. And as you know, instability equates to growth and strength. So. It does, but the, the other aspect of free weights and the benefit of free weights um, with dumbbells in particular, or maybe even kettlebells, you, you identify, it helps you identify the imbalance, any imbalance that a certain side has, and it helps you, it, it, it notifies you of that imbalance, and therefore you can work on correcting the imbalance. Which is why we love dumbbells, and why dumbbells right. are always the core uh, movement, whether it's flat benching, incline benching, or overhead benching, that's where we take it down to the ultra basics when we get into the dumbbells because there's nothing more unstable than a pair of dumbbells, right? And that's what we want. We want that instability. Uh, so, the, a lot of really good, good bench pressers use overhead pressing as a bench assistance movement. Uh, really great benchers like uh, Eddie Cohn, who is uh, 550 for a double raw, Joe Ladnier, 600 raw. These guys did overhead pressing, particularly the press behind the neck. We have found that while the overhead press, while improving the overhead press will push up the bench press, improving the bench press will not necessarily push up the overhead press. So it's kind of a weird one-way street. Uh, kind of similar to deadlifting and squatting. Whereas if you, if you deadlift the way that we deadlift, if you push your squat up, your dead automatically goes up. However, pushing your deadlift does not push up your squat, right? So that's, again, that kind of weird one-way street. But uh, Ed and Joe Ladnier both were big believers in the press behind the neck, and both of them could do 400-pound press behind the neck seated Wayne, Eddie would weigh 220, Joe would weigh maybe 230, um, massive, massive weights. Ed, Ed could do 350 for five in the press behind the neck. At the time, his uh, flat bench was 550 for a double, so it was a good good relationship. Okay, what else you got? That's, that's a lot of weights. Give us an idea, you know, we, we know a lot of the records on bench press and things like that, but real quick, what are... 
bad press. Well, I don't really think we should get into it because by the time the overhead press uh, was banned, it got so ridiculous that it had turned into into actually a standing pushture. So, you know, you had guys like David Rigert right at the end. Rigert ended up at the all-time world press uh, record uh, gotten rid of in 1972. Unbelievable. That's a hell of a lot of weight to push over your head. Actually, the, um, the, actually the bigger problem that they had was cleaning the weights. The press styles were so loose at the end, they were really uh, standing push jerks. And most of the guys were having a heart of, uh, I know Kenny Patera was, was terribly handicapped with how much he could clean, right? If he could clean it, he could press it. Uh, right. Patera was capable of a 550 press off the racks. The most he ever did was 505 because he couldn't clean it. Yeah, because in competition, you didn't have it on the rack, right? No, you, you, didn't, have, no, you didn't have it on the racks. That's a lot of weight to, to uh, have to pull off the floor like that. Mm, so that was a lot of man. Originally, initially, when the press came on the scene in the in the 20s and 30s, it was what they called the military press. You've heard that phrase, right? Military yeah. press. Military yeah. press implied that you had to press with your heels together. You had to stay bolt upright. And what this meant was that in order to press the weight overhead, the weight had to go forward to get around your chin. Again, because you're bolt upright. So... That was the first iteration, and again, it was the military press. Well, the officials decided to loosen up a little bit and let the guys spread their feet, and they also allowed them to establish a layback at the start of the press. So the second iteration of the, of the Olympic press was, was the layback press. And basically what it was is the guys would just lay back just enough so that the bar would clear the face, kind of turning it into, um, I don't want to say a 45 degree incline press because that's a little a little low, although some of the Russians and Finns exceeded that down the line. But guys like Paul Anderson and uh, Jim Bradford were able to push 400 using the layback style, which is incredible at the time. I think Anderson shattered the world press record by 50 or 55 pounds when he came on the scene. He pushed it up from like... Uh, 355 to 402. He was, uh, you know, he was a brother from another planet. Oh, uh, so let me continue. So that was the that was the second iteration, the layback. So then the Russians got clever and they said, well, hey, here's an idea. We'll lay back, but when the head judge says press, we're gonna jolt erect, which will throw the weight to our nose, then we're going to lay back again and catch the weight on arm's length. So now we had this little gymnastics thing going on where they'd, they'd start from the lay back, get the press signal, stand erect, fire that weight up to head height, then dip back underneath it, right? That was called the Russian press or the Olympic press. So that was the third iteration. Uh, then the Finns came along and they said, well, hey, how about this? We'll start standing upright, we'll get the press signal, we'll slump, heave, throw the weight back up to the forehead, now get a, lay, a, a third layback. So again, you can see how this thing's getting trickier and trickier and trickier, and all this is happening in an eye blink, right? From the time the guy says press to the time the weight's overhead, it's like whoop, and it's overhead. So it was uh, difficult to judge because it was difficult to see. The final iteration of the press and what got it banned was they started to allow the guys to start with unlocked knees. So if you're starting a press with unlocked knees, to me that's a push jerk. And they allowed that to happen for I think about two years and then they, they finally said, hey, you know what, let's just get rid of the press. It'll shorten the competitions uh, and we won't have this difficulty of judging it. So that was the end of, end of the press in 1972. And that was your best lift, right? Well, I was never any 
I was never going to amount to a hill of beans as an Olympic lifter because I didn't have the requisite flexibility and speed. But yeah, the press, the press was the big lift for all the strong guys because we would clean the weight and then we could push it overhead. And the guys that had all the, the, the good snatches and the clean and jerks were super fast, kind of acrobatic guys. They usually weren't too good in the press because the press is a power movement. So yeah. when they eliminated the press, most of the studs kind of kind of left Olympic lifting, or at least the, the pushing studs. Right, and you were one of them. Well, I was out the door you before that. And I, yeah, I, I saw the handwriting on the wall. There was no way I was going to go, going to go much further in that sport. I was bullying the weights around. You can't bull um, weights around in Olympic lifting. You have to explode yeah. them. Yeah, we love it. Uh, we like to, any time you're starting a press routine, we typically like to start the guys off with standing dumbbell press. Again, as you pointed out, that identifies any structural weaknesses. If the, you know, the left arm is significantly weaker than the right arm, it'll come to the surface. Also, we're real big on our press technique, we want the weights to come all the way down to the shoulders on every rep, and we want full and complete lockout. Typically what you see is the guys will get, whether it's a dumbbell or a bar, they get the bar moving, and then they kind of work the, the, the middle three quarters of the lift. They never quite lock out, and they never quite let the weight come all the way down. And because of that, they can handle a hell of a lot more weight, but it's, um, it's a false god, right? Dumbbells obviously are narrow grip. You don't have any. You don't have any say over that. And also, we like to have the dumbbells uh, V up at the top. We want to have meat at the top. We don't want to have them flaring out. Uh, the the classic press barbell press is the press out of the racks, which avoids the power clean, which most people find cumbersome. So you set up in the squat racks. Uh, you dip under like you're going to do a front squat. You step back. Put your feet a little bit wider than shoulder width or shoulder width. Establish a base. Lock your ass, lock your thighs, lock your legs. You've got to have a good push platform. Uh, what's that cliche? You don't want to fire a cannon from a canoe, right? right? Same thing with pressing. You want to establish, really lock that tail out hard. And establish enough layback so that when the bar travels up and back, which is the path we want, it clears the face and certainly be sure that it clears the face on the way down but you know that's that's basically it we want slightly wider than shoulder width grip on the the barbell press uh press behind the neck uh we don't do a lot of those standing that's primarily a seated movement and in the press behind the neck what you want is that when you put your your arms out to the side, your, your arms form a right angle. Your forearms and your uh, upper arm form a right angle. So that's your press behind the neck grip. Almost like a squat, like you're going to do a squat, but now you're going to press behind the neck. Okay. It, you know, there's a lot of people that can't do the press behind the neck because absolutely. they've got pain in, in the shoulders. I am one of them. I am one of them. I can't do those things. It feels like so it's going to rip my shoulder down. All together, or, is, or are there different techniques that will help you kind of get around the pain a little bit? No, don't get around the pain. Just go to dumbbell presses or front presses. It's not that, yeah. big, it's not that big a deal, right? It, yeah. Press is a press is a press. As you know, Gertrude Stein said about a rose is a rose is a rose. But I knew you know that, J.P. Long J 
longevity is key. So you have to kind of change your mentality a little bit about the weight you're lifting and your form and and your consistency and everything. So Roger that. What else you want to say about uh, the overhead press? Do them. I mean, we covered a good amount. Do them. Include Do them. them. Okay. If Include. You're able. You done? Okay. Okay, let me finish. Do them. Okay? Do yeah. your overhead pressing. Do them on a, a, a different day than your benching. Uh, we typically bench once a week, do overhead presses once a week. Uh, we put the bench and the overhead press at opposite ends of the training week, just like we put the squat and the deadlift at opposite ends of the training week, right? Yeah. When, on your press day, uh, you can come in, you have a nice free weight menu. You can do dumbbells, standing or seated. You can do front press, standing. You could do the old clean and press, you know. It's, it's still physiologically possible. Uh, you can do seated press behind the necks. Uh, typically, we have to have a kind of a special device or a training partner hand that one off to you. But do them. Again, we love the five rep set. We love uh, either work up to a single all-out, triple, double, five, and then do some back-offs. Uh, and again, you can stay with one exercise, or you could do uh, you could work up to a five using barbells, and then drop back and get a couple sets of six to eight using dumbbells. Uh, there's a million different different variants, but do do the overhead pressing. I myself dropped the overhead pressing for about 10 years, I had thought that my benching would automatically keep my overhead pressing off. It didn't happen. When I did happen to try some overhead pressing, I was shocked at how weak I was. I had thought that I would retain, you know, maybe 75% of my old pressing ability, and that, that, didn't, that didn't happen. And I had to get back on my overhead pressing, and it was unbelievable how much I had lost. When it comes to shoulder development, when it and also triceps, man, you gotta, you guys gotta lock those overhead presses out because they are a tremendous tricep developer, but only if you lock out your overhead presses. Again, most most people, most guys just kind of fling them up, and then let them fall back down. That's not an overhead press, right? That's some sort of a bodybuilder, pumper upper. Overhead press, every rep has to go to full and complete lockout, hold it for a beat, and then feel the lowering, right? Just don't let the sucker free fall. You know, don't throw away the negative. Uh, yeah, but it is the, the number one shoulder developer. You need overhead pressing. Don't neglect it. If you haven't been doing it, jump back in with some, uh, some standing barbell or some standing dumbbell. It's an easy thing, you know, and they're enjoyable. And also, they're pretty, pretty difficult to mess them up from a tech, technical viewpoint. It's not like teaching a squat or a deadlift, which is a very complicated uh, physiologic, you know, ballet. Uh, pressing is is pretty idiot proof, you know. It, again, as long as you lower the rep all the way down, lock out every rep, you're going to get the benefit of it. But certainly, one time a week. Uh, currently, we're doing multiple sets. We'll work uh, multiple sets using a static weight. We might work up to uh, three fives or four fours or five threes or something like that uh, when we're, we're dealing with a specialization program. We're doing a lot of shoulder specialization as of late in the off season to try to bring our bench up, right? Yep. So that's what's going on with that. Thank you. And I can't argue with anything that you said. <laughs> Who might argue, right? All right. Except my guys don't have any injuries. What's that? I said, I said you were... All right, so we're done on that. Great information on the uh, overhead press. Again, I'm going to post a couple of articles that we've done in the past that address uh, shoulder pressing, overhead pressing. They'll be on Facebook here within uh, about a half hour, so check those out. And leading into that, uh, don't forget to check out Marty's weekly 
weekly column on uh, on ironcompany.com. It's raw with Marty Gallagher. He's got all kinds of great things on there to talk about uh, resistance training, nutrition, brain training, cardio training, all types of good stuff. I'm a life coach. Um, he is available for online training. Yes. His uh, contact information is on our athletes page. So if you'd like to uh, talk with him about anything, your squat, your deadlift, you know, uh, nutrition, anything, contact him through our website. Go to the athletes page. Um, on our website as well, you'll find his books, Purposeful Primitive and Strong Medicine. They can be purchased at ironcompany.com as well as amazon.com. Uh, and finally, uh, just like this week, you know, we had a guy that uh, wanted to talk about the overhead press. If you've got anything that you want to suggest uh, that, um, you know, whether it's nutrition or resistance training or anything uh, related to fitness, you want to you want to hear it discussed and go into detail. Just let us know on Facebook. Just hit us up, and uh, we can schedule that within the next couple of weeks or so. So, I think that's going to do it, and we're going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you again, Marty. Thank you. Get off those machines and get on those free weights. That's right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.